Hi everybody, this is Pastor Sean Klein of Hernando United Methodist Church, and I just wanted to do a quick run through of what took place at General Conference last week. I know many of you had a lot of questions about it and wasn't quite sure what it meant, so I wanted to just give you a quick rundown of all that took place, hopefully so that we're all on the same page. Over the course of General Conference, there were three major votes that took place. They were the three that I uh, outlined in my letter. And to say three major votes is a bit of an understatement. There were hundreds of votes that took place, many of which that had to do with the same things, just in different places of the Book of Discipline. But for the sake of ease, there were three major issues that were tackled. And I believe that when we talk about all of those issues together, we tell a story, one that is more helpful for us to move forward as a church. The first thing that General Conference dealt with was the budget. The budget was cut by a pretty significant amount. Uh, it, some article said that, and this was in United Methodist News, that this was the largest budget cut that the United Methodist Church had experienced since the 1980s. This was a significant cut, and it was propelled by two things, and I'm sure you can guess what they are if you've been paying attention to the United Methodist Church lately. It was propelled first by the fact that the church everywhere seems to be shrinking. We have been very fortunate that we as a church at Hernando UMC have been in a period of growth, and I know that we always wish the growth was faster, but we have been growing, and that is an incredible blessing, and we're grateful for it. But the church especially across the United States, has been shrinking. And therefore, the budget has to shrink. This has been propelled especially within the United Methodist Church because of the disaffiliations that have taken place. About a quarter of the churches in the Florida United Methodist Conference disaffiliated. We're about three quarters the size that we were when the disaffiliation process started a few years ago. The budget cuts were there to help alleviate some of the stresses that came from that reality. And that is the place that we start, it is the fact that we are a shrinking church, um, <clears throat> largely, not us specifically, but the United Methodist Church is currently a shrinking church that has just dealt with a number of disaffiliations, and therefore we have to make budgetary decisions that better reflect stewardship, good stewardship of the money that the United Methodist Church brings in. And so those budget cuts were the very first thing. The disaffiliations took place, and this was the second major issue that was tackled by annual, or the general conference, excuse me. The disaffiliations that took place specifically took place largely over the issues surrounding and the conversations surrounding human sexuality that we as a church have been having since the United Methodist Church has been founded. We have had arguments on the floor of General Conference since the year 1972. The very first full General Conference of the United Methodist Church was in 1972, and we have been talking about human sexuality ever since. This year, in general conference, a number of votes were taken that would allow for same-sex marriages to take place in churches and also <clears throat> for LGBTQ plus people to be ordained as clergy. Now, I know that that is a big change from where we were. There were a number of votes that took place that removed certain language, but I wanted to make note, and I hope that you hear this because I think it's important. There was language added to the Book of Discipline, specifically. What those votes did was not ensure that every United Methodist Church was open to a same-sex wedding or an LGBTQ plus pastor. That's not what took place. Instead, what those votes allowed churches to do was make the decisions that best fit their contexts. If somebody came to me and asked if they could have a same-sex wedding here at Hernando United Methodist Church, it would come to a vote at our council, and the church would be welcome to come and take part of that meeting and come and have conversations about whether or not we want to do that. The language that was added to the Book of Discipline specifically said that 
Bishops and district superintendents could not force a church to hold a wedding that they did not want to hold, nor could they punish a pastor for holding a wedding that the, the bishop or the district superintendent didn't agree with. It left the decision up to the individual churches to make so that we as a church can make the best decisions for us and that other churches, United Methodist churches, can make the best decisions for them. This, I think, is a useful way for us to move forward. We get to stay within however we see our conscious leading and allow other churches to make those decisions for themselves as well. And we can look at those other churches even when we agree or disagree and say we can still be in communion with one another. That, friends, is a gift. I really believe that. It is a chance for us to continue in ministry because we still agree on the essentials, the main essential even, that we believe in a God who is three in one, a God who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we believe that Jesus came and died so that we might truly live. That essential is still at the center of our faith. And in order to assist with that, the third major issue that was tackled by General Conference was regionalization. In the Book of Discipline, and specifically our church's constitution, we allow for certain regions of the church to make decisions about parts of the Book of Discipline, to make changes and edits, to allow them to minister better in the contexts, recognizing that the context of an African church or an or a West Asian church or even an East Asian church or even a European church, that those contexts are very different than our own. The only region that was not allowed to make those decisions for themselves was the United States. It was how it was written in our Constitution. The General Conference voted to upend that, to allow for the United States to make those same kinds of edits so that we could better serve our own context. That contextualization of our particular region has not taken full effect yet. That was the one vote or set of votes at General Conference that required a number of votes to take place. Because it was a constitutional change, it required a supermajority, a 66% or higher majority um, at the General Conference vote, but it also requires for a supermajority of annual conferences to vote in the affirmative of that particular action. And so you may hear this year at annual conference here in Florida that another vote was taken on regionalization. Every annual conference will be taking a similar vote to see if we can actually amend the Constitution to allow our churches to make those changes, specifically in the United States, that better fit our context. I know that it may have felt like a lot changed at General Conference. I know that here at our church, we don't always see eye to eye on every issue. That's a part of what it means to be a family. That's a part of what it means to be a church. The reality is, is we're never going to agree on everything. But we do, friends, agree on the essentials. We agree on the most important parts of our faith. We agree on the truth of who Jesus Christ was. We agree on the virgin birth. We agree that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and that we are bound together by the Holy Spirit. Those essentials, they are what bind us together. And in everything else, our church, the United Methodist Church, is saying, especially when we're talking about human sexuality, we're saying, yes, it's important. It is important that we have these conversations, but it is not an essential part of what makes us United Methodist Christians. We recognize that there are contexts where LGBTQ plus people will be served well, and there are contexts where we don't have to do that work, where we can leave it to somebody else. And no matter how we end up going about that as a church, we can look at those who we disagree with, those on the other side of that, and say, yeah, we still love you because we still see Jesus in you. That is what took place at General Conference. 
And I hope that this is something that is comforting to hear because we have the opportunity to be in ministry now with a group of people who otherwise were often shoved to the side. I hope that we, as a church, we prayerfully consider and prayerfully discern where we're called to be, whether it is welcoming those folks in with open arms or looking to them and saying, maybe not today here, but let's find you a place where you can worship. God loves us, and God wants all of us to be in relationship. And so we have the opportunity now, as a church, to do that work well. I hope that this was helpful for you. As always, you can reach out to me with any questions that you have. And if I don't know the answer, and that's pretty often, I'll do my best to get the answer to you. Um, <clears throat> and I also invite you to take some time to look at some of Bishop Tom Berlin's, our Florida Conference bishop, some of his messages about what took place at uh, general Conference. He is a wonderful communicator, much more eloquent than I am, and he is a well of information. Either way, brothers and sisters, I will be praying for you and for our church and for the whole of the Methodist church and the Methodist movement, and I hope you will be too. We know more than anything, prayer is something that works. So continue to be in prayer for your church, be in prayer for one another, and be in prayer that we might work together so that God's kingdom may come here today in this place and that it might start with us. Amen, brothers and sisters.